Now that we have gone through test one, we are now moving on into chapter three and chapter four. These are going to be the two chapters that we're going to be focusing on for test two. So chapter three is a little bit different than, than what we've seen so far in, in chapters one and, and two specifically, where chapters one and two really are more conceptual based. Chapter three is all based in the concepts in chapter two, but we're going to be employing systematic processes in order to basically solve, solve networks of systems that we can't readily collapse. Most circuits, we actually can't just readily collapse and start analyzing like we did for the material in test two. So what we're going to be looking at is basically how do we look at, at, at a system and determine voltages and currents when, when we can't actually break down the system with equivalent resistance resistive resistive techniques and so there's two of them that we're going to be looking at in chapter three specifically one's called nodal analysis that we're going to be looking at today and the second one is is basically what we call loop or mesh analysis and nodal analysis is actually based off of kcl where we find unknown voltages and loop analysis is based off kvl which we're going to be utilizing to find unknown currents the nice thing about these processes is that once we've actually performed the analysis technique, we got all the information that we need to know about the circuit. But the, the types of circuits that we're looking at are really based off passive elements. So, so in this case, we're really working with uh, resistors and basically current sources and voltage sources. And, and later on for the circuits two group, for the electricals, we're going to be utilizing this method for, for basically alternating current analysis and what we call a steady state. So this is very, very applicable until we get to the point where we start looking at um, some specific electronic components in which we're amplifying a signal. But for right now, we're basically looking at processes based off a property called linearity. We'll talk about that in another class. But we're going to show you the process itself. And the nice thing is about nodal analysis is that if you stick with the assumptions and stay consistent throughout the process itself, then you will come up with the correct answer every time. But you have to stay consistent with the process. So first off, what is nodal analysis? What is, what is this analysis technique? And how can we utilize it in order to find information about a circuit without actually trying to collapse anything. So nodal analysis is a systematic application of Kirchhoff's current law to obtain a set of simultaneous equations to solve for unknown node voltages. Guys, this is the reason why you guys took linear algebra before you came to this class. It was so, so, so that you guys could actually come in here and not have to go through the process of learning how to do matrix algebra. You came in here hot, ready to go, just in the same way that you're taking differential equations right now so that the electricals, when they move on to circuits two, they hit the ground running with knowing how to solve differential equations. Here, the method is actually really comprised of five steps. The first thing that we do is label unknown node voltages. Now, we'll, we'll discuss what, what a node voltage is in just a second. And then the second part is that we draw what we consider elemental currents, currents that are actually going to be flowing through the resistor. And then we apply KCL at each node, summation of currents equal to the summation of current out. Then we expand those KV, uh, KCL equations by Ohm's law and then we start combining like variables. And we start doing that because once we do, we actually can develop a matrix, a matrix C, matrix A, basically a variable matrix, and that's equal to matrix B. And we're going to solve the systematic equation by performing row reduction in order to put it into echelon form. And once we put it into echelon form, then we actually have everything that we need to know about those values for the node voltages. So, there's a specific form that, that we're really concerned with. And I, and I always start off with this form up front because I want you guys to know where it comes from. I could easily just show you, just show you examples and just say, we'll draw this current here and label these nodes. But you guys know already that I don't like to do that. I want y'all to see where this comes from. So let's take a very, very, very simple circuit. Now this is on 
actually on the fundamentals uh, of, of DC analysis sheet that I gave you guys at the very beginning of the class. And I want you to, we're going to derive this form that we're going to be utilizing to analyze these circuits with nodal analysis. So because it's an application of KCL, we have to start off with the current. And I'm just, this simple series loop here, we're going to look at the current that's actually going through this resistor here. And I'm going to say we have basically three element circuit here, single series loop. Here we got VS, we got a resistor, and we got this guy right here, VQ, I'm going to orientate its polarity in such a manner. And so by passive sign convention, we're going to just, we're just going to say that the current's going to leave this positive terminal and then by passive sign convention, go into the positive terminal of this resistor, and then actually we're going to see a voltage drop from that, and then we're actually going to have a voltage drop over here from VQ. Now, it doesn't really, really matter at all what these values are. What matters is actually how we actually label the circuit and then consistently solve it, reference back to how we have labeled the flow of current. So. We're going to talk more about that as we go, especially when we get into specific examples where we can see maybe our assumptions weren't necessarily correct, but that will be okay because the math will tell us so. All right, so the first step was to label unknown node voltages. Now, because I put these as variables, we don't know what they are, so it doesn't really matter. So here, if we measure from this point to ground, for those of you who are in the lab, you'll know what I really mean by that. Now, this is just a common point here but we measure from this point to ground, we, we know that that voltage at that point up here will actually be Vs. And if we measure from this point to ground, then that will be Vq, okay? So Vs from here to ground, Vq from here to ground. So these are two what we consider the node voltages. Now we know that that the voltage uh, for, the, for the source and this source are respectively Vs and Vq, but I'm talking specifically about the node voltage here at this point. Now, for here, this resistor right here, based off this current, we're going to say that, that that is orientated as positive to negative in that direction. And so, number two, I'm going to draw an assumption of that elemental current. What I mean by elemental current, that's the current that's flowing through that resistor right here. And I'm going to say it's going to move from Vs all the way through the resistor to Vq. So moving from Vs to Vq, and I'm going to just say that that is I1. So we're going to go through the closed loop right now and see if we can actually, by KVL, write out an equation and then rewrite this current in terms of basically voltages. So let's take a look here. By KVL, sure enough, Vs is equal to Vr because that was a drop. And then our assumed polarity here, Vq, that was a drop as well. So Vs is equal to Vr plus Vq. Now, because I said the elemental current, I'm going to rewrite Vr in terms of Vs and Vq. So I just take Vq, move it over to the other side. And so Vr itself, that voltage across that resistor is actually going to be Vs minus Vq. Because obviously, if we're going by KVL, Vs provides the, the, the source for more just, maybe we can think of it as a greater source or something like that. And then we have VR and VQ on the side, so therefore we can actually say that VR is comprised of subtracting off this value of VQ from VS. So VR is equal to VS minus VQ, and that's equal to R times I1 by Ohm's law. And so by Ohm's law here, I can actually rewrite I1 in terms of VS and VQ by dividing through by that resistive value. So I1 is equal to Vs minus Vq divided by R. And if we look real closely, look where the arrow is pointing. The arrow is pointing towards node Vq. And so by that notion, we see right here that, this, that, that the node voltage that we subtract off is the one that the arrow is pointing towards. So, Again, I1 is equal to Vs minus Vq divided by R. And this is the form that we're going to be expanding 
the KCL equation by over the next three examples. So, again, this, this is not arbitrary. You'll see this in the book. This is not arbitrary at all. This is not something I just throw out to you guys and say, let's just solve it in this way or in this way. And uh, we're just going to trust what Mr. Morley says. No, 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 no. It's directly derived from KVL and just a different way of rewriting that current in terms of VS and VQ and also R. So let's take a look at the first example. Very, very small, uh, different type of circuit that you guys have probably seen up until this point. And if we look at this, uh, ooh, we got two current sources here. We got five amps at the top, got 10 amps at the bottom, and, oh man, like, I don't think I can break this down. No, I can't collapse anything. I can't, I can't combine six and two. No, there's no way to do that. They're not parallel. Uh, well, I don't even, I know there's no way to, to combine these two. Oh man, we're gonna have to use systematic processes in order to actually solve this system. And we're gonna find V1 and V2. And if we actually find V1 and V2, we will have every single bit of information that we need to know about the circuit because the voltage of V1 will actually be the voltage across the two ohm resistor. The voltage of V2 will actually be the voltage across the six ohm resistor. And if we were curious about the voltage across the four ohm resistor, it would just be V1 minus V2 based off of the assumption that I drew these currents. So I labeled off the first portion here, first portion of the method, V1 and V2. Those are our unknown node voltages. Second, second portion, I drew the assumption of the current flow. And I stayed consistent in this problem with the current source direction. Here, current source is pointing towards the left. So I'm going to say that I1 is going to drive into node V1. And that's going to split from there. And it's going to split into I3 and split into I2. So I'm going to allow I3, and I'm going to assume, I'm not really sure, I'm not really sure if this is correct, but I'm going to assume that I3 flows from V1 through the 2 ohm resistor to ground. And I'm going to assume that V1, sorry, I2 moves from V1 to V2 through the 4 ohm resistor. So moving from V1 through the 4 ohm resistor to V2. And I5 moves from V2 all the way to the ground. And I'm going to stay consistent with the direction of the 10 amp source in which I4 is going to flow into V2. Okay. So I want to really stress the word assumption. There is no reason whatsoever in these problems to sit here and try to predetermine the actual accurate direction of these currents. There's no reason to. Because of this is a systematic process, basically just draw whatever you think, whatever looks cool, uh, as far as the direction of current, and just start solving. Sometimes you're not going to be able to act accurately determine, predetermine those, those current directions, but the nice thing is, is that the math will do the work for you. If you come up with a negative sign on your answer, that just means that some of your, your assumptions were backwards. It means that one of your currents were flipped and actually going in the opposite direction. We're going to see that happen. We're going to see how that works as we go through several example problems. But that's one of the nice things about a systematic process is because once you draw out your currents, as long as you stay consistent with writing your equations, reference to how you have labeled the direction of these currents in this problem, the math will do the work for you. And that's really, really nice. I love, oh man, I, I love nodal analysis, man. I love this because the work, the math is just doing the work for us. And, you know, it's taken, taken something like what, uh, how, how many years of schooling before the math starts doing the work for us? Uh, I'll take that. So, so, so keep this in your mind. We're going to move the camera over to this side of the board and we're going to start working through this problem, okay? All right, so re-referenced, and let's see, maybe, maybe I can turn, turn this just a little bit so that we have the problem right there. Sure enough, awesome. So I'm going to write out 
the KCL equation, we have two nodes, so that means we're going to have two unknown variables of V1. And so we're going to write out the KCL equation at each node, and then we're going to expand that by essentially Ohm's law and the form that I showed over here that we developed from KVL. And then we're just going to go ahead and combine like variables, put into a matrix, click RREF, row reduce echelon form, and get our voltages from it. So I1 is equal to I2 plus I3, so I1 was flowing into V1, and here I2 and I3 were leaving out, so, some, so current in is equal to current out. And when we expand that, we got 5 amps, and that's going to be equal, in this case, V1 minus V2 for I2 divided by 4. And here, V1 minus 0, because we got, we got a common or ground at the bottom, and that has a potential of 0 volts. So V1 minus 0 divided by 2. And so if I take these and break these out in terms of their like variables of V1 and V2, I trust that you guys know how to do that, then that's equal to 5, and that's equal to 0.75 times V1 minus 0.25 V2. Let's look at the currents at V2 here. From the looks of this right here, we got currents I2 and I4 flowing into node V2 and current I5 going out. Is that correct? Nah. Nah. Because we, ha we absolutely have to consider this upper loop here as well. And that current source is flowing, is driving a current in a direction that's flowing from V2 to V1. So we also have to put in basically this current here of I1, which was 5 amps that we, sh that we showed before, as leaving V2 as well. So I2 plus I4 is equal to I1 plus I5. So if I expand that out by the current voltage characteristics, we got V1 minus V2 divided by 4 plus 10 amps. That's equal to 5 plus V2 minus 0 divided by 6. Go ahead and we re rearrange the equation and put it into such a form where we've combined the like variables. So 5 is equal to po negative 0.25 V1 and then plus 0.4167 V2. So now we just develop a matrix, matrix A, X equal to B. So we get 0.75, negative 0.25, negative 0 0.25, 0 0.4167. All we do is just put that into, basically put it into the calculator, or mm, what I really like to do is put it into MATLAB. And then just put it into row reduce echelon form. You should remember how to do that by hand, by the way, but you got your calculator with you. I'm not worried about that. We're not, I'm not teaching you guys how to do linear algebra in here. We're applying it now. So when we apply that and we row reduce, put it into echelon form, bam, V1, V2, are equal here 13.3 volts and then V2 is equal to 20 volts. So let's talk about that just a little bit. So the voltage across that 2 ohm resistor over there is actually equal to 13.3 volts. And the voltage across V2 is equal roughly about 20 volts. But what about the 4 ohm resistor? If we look right up here, that 4 ohm resistor had the current I2 flowing through it. I2 is equal to V1 minus V2. Whoa, what about that? So V1 minus V2, so that's equal to 13.3 minus 20 volts. That means that we would get a negative number right here for the voltage across that 4 ohm resistor. Huh. Well, oh, is, that, is that a problem? No, it's not. It's not at all. If we look at node V2 right there, that has 10 amps going into it. That's a lot of current. Double the current that's at the top loop. So in fact, actually, it's probably going to drive current to go in the opposite certain direction. So in fact, here, if we were looking at I2, V1 minus V2 would give us a negative number, divide that by 4 ohms. That means this current here will also have a negative value. Meaning that my assumption of that current flow, I2, is actually in the opposite direction. And there's nothing wrong with that. It just means that that negative sign is there 
just means the assumption of my direction of the current and also the polarity of that voltage would actually have been the opposite. Okay, cool. Well, that just means that, that I would just go back and at some point redraw that flow of current if I wanted to. But think about what we just found here. We found the voltage across those three elements. We were able to find the current of I2, find out that it was actually moving in the opposite direction, all by a systematic process. And that's the beauty of nodal analysis, guys. And that's going to be the beauty when we get into uh, loop analysis or what we call mesh analysis as well that we can basically solve the entire circuit with basically a little bit of analysis and a little bit of know-how with linear algebra. So let's, uh, let, let's just keep moving forward and let's look at example two. Let's see if I can actually get both of these examples into here. Oh, sweet, cool. All right, so for example two, still got a two, two unknown node circuit here. Uh, we still got two, two current sources, but I just wanted to, wanted to do another problem that, that was eh, probably looks a little bit more like what we've seen so far um, as far as a layout in the class with no upper loop. So we got a three amp source, we got two ohms, six ohms, seven ohms, and then 12 amps. <coughs> Excuse me. So I'm going to label my unknown node voltages. Here, V1 and V2. So two unknown nodes. We need two systematic equations, guys. So, and I'm just going to draw out my currents. I try, this is typically how I like to draw my currents in this direction, basically kind of starting on the left and let them propagate out to the right. It doesn't matter what direction they are. You guys could take them off and just make them go all the way to the left. I don't care. As long as you are correct and consistent with how you expand those equations. So for V1, I'm going to say we have I1 going in, and then I2 and I3 are leaving out. Now we have I3 going into V2, and then I4 and I5 leaving V2. So I1 is equal to I2 plus I3. Current in is equal to current out. I'm going to expand that by, by Ohm's law, that form that we developed earlier before. So here 3 amps is equal to V1 minus 0 divided by 2 plus I3, which is V1 minus V2 divided by 6. Go ahead and basically rewrite that in terms of common variables, V1 and V2. So 0.67 V1 minus 0.167 V2, and that's equal to 3 amps. Let's take a look at V2 here. So here, I3 is going into V2, and then I4 and I5 are leaving. Ah, but look at this. Look at this, guys. Well, we already have the form of I3, so we want to stay consistent with that. And also, make note here that I draw my currents all the way from V1 to V2. That helps you stay consistent. So once I've already labeled out I3, I3 is V1 minus V2, Divide by 6, sure enough, we, we can go ahead and just rewrite that over here just from that guy. I3 is V1 minus V2 divided by 6. And then that is actually going to be equal to the currents flowing out, summation of those currents flowing out, I4 and I5. So here we get 12 plus V2 minus 0 divided by 7. Remember that I5 is actually going in the direction of our current source, and therefore, we just put 12 down here. Could we actually allow I5 to flow into V2? We sure could. It would just be negative 12 amps because that would be in opposite direction. Go ahead and combine like variables here. Negative 0.167 times V1, and then plus 0.31 V2, and that's equal to essentially negative 12 once we actually maneuver this equation over. So again, just as we've done before, guys, develop our matrix here, 0.67 minus 0.167, and then negative 0.167, then 0.31. V1 and V2 is equal to 3 and negative 12. Uh, look at this. V1 is equal to negative 0.67. V2 is equal to negative 42 volts. So, sorry, that was negative 6 volts right there. 
So that actually makes sense for, for this problem because we have 12 volts that's moving down towards ground that's actually going to drive current to go in the opposite direction, which would drive negative values for V1 and V2. So this just means that, that our assumption of the current flows may be opposite as well. So and we'd have to actually go back and take a look at that. So let's take a look at example three here, final example. This is, this is more indicative of, of a generalized example. X1, X, sorry, example one, example two, those are, they're pretty basic. Here, we're actually going to you know, crank it up a notch. We're going to have three unknown node voltages and we're going to have multiple loops in here. So here, no reason, mind me on this, no reason whatsoever to label a node right here for 50 volts. There's no reason to do that. We got 50 volts right here. 50 volts, we know what that is. And we're going to use it in just a bit. We only care in nodal analysis about unknown node voltages. So, same thing over here. We have, 20, we have a node in between 40 ohms and 20 volts, but we don't care about this node right here because we already know what it is. It's 20 volts at that node. 20 volts. No need to, to label anything else. So what we got, as far as unknown node voltages, here we got a node here, I drew it out, labeled it, labeled one right here, labeled one right here, V1, V2, and V3. So that means we have three unknown node voltages, that means we need three simultaneous equations in order to solve this problem. And for this problem, I'm just going to show you the way, you know, just, just as we've done before, of rewriting the KCL equation, and generally on the test, this is all I really want you guys to get to. And the problems, go ahead and just solve them all the way through to where you get those unknown node voltages. But in the test, once you actually show me the, the appropriate expansion of the KCL equation, that's all I really need to see in order to know that you know how to solve these problems. So I just went ahead again and drew out the assumption of these current flows. And yeah, let's, uh, let's go ahead and just start solving. So again, it doesn't matter. You could, you could have written all of these or drawn these current flows in the opposite direction. It doesn't really matter. It doesn't really matter at all, guys. So I1 is moving into V1. I2, I3, and I4 are moving out at V2. We got I3 moving in. I5 is flowing out. I6 is flowing out. Here we got V3, I6 is going in, I7 is going out, I8 is going out, and then that five amps, remember that current, you know, that current source over there, I4 is moving through the five amps and being driven down into V3 as well. So here we actually have I6 and I4 impacting V3. So let's go ahead and just expand out this, you know, set of equations here. So V1, I1 current in is equal to the currents flowing out, is equal to I2 plus I3 plus I4. So here we got 50 minus V1 divided by 10. Ah, we had a voltage source here, so 50 minus V1. Remember when we had, had, had Vs minus Vq? Here we, we have that 50 volts, we know what that is. 50 minus V1 over 10. That's going to be equal to V1 minus 0, or common of 0 volts, divided by 12. I3 moving from V1 to V2. So it's V1 minus V2 divided by 25 ohms, as we have here. And then that current source up there is driving I4 to be directly 5 amps. Let's take a look at V2 here. Here we got I3. Once again, we already have that. Oh yeah, bam, right here. Already got that. We got V I3, and that's equal to I5 plus I6. So I3 expanding that again. V1 minus V2 divided by 25. I5 is V2 minus zero divided by 20 ohms. Sure enough, right here. And then V2 minus V3 for I, for I6 divided by that. 30 ohms, sure enough. V2 minus V3 divided by 30. All right, you guys hear all the beeping, I'm sorry, I forgot to uh, silence my phone. 
Well, don't forget right here, guys, for V3, that that current is still going to be flowing into V3 as well as I4. So V3, that's going to be equal to I4 plus I6, and that's equal to I7 plus I8. So I4, as we had before, was 5 amps. It's consistent with the direction of that current flow. I6, we already have from V4. That's V3 minus V, sorry, V2 minus V3 divided by 30 ohms. And then I7, that's what's flowing out of here. V3 minus 0 divided by 15. And finally, oh, look at this. I8 is flowing from V3 through the 40 ohm resistor to the 20 volt source. And so from here, that is V3 minus 20 divided by 40 ohms. And sure enough, we get V3 minus 20 divided by 40 ohms. And then also flowing down was V3 minus 0, 15. So these forms right here, guys, are essentially these expansions are kind of what, what I would expect to see on a test. You know, on your, on your homework, you should be doing what we did for example one and example two, going through and actually developing the matrix and solving the system that will just help you just reinforce your, your understanding of linear algebra. But you know, for, for testing purposes, this is all I really need to see from you guys to know, your, to know that you know the concepts very, very well. So I'm going to have you guys working on some homework for, for nodal analysis. In the next video, we're going to be looking at loop analysis, which is